Amy. Uh, it's a simple one in a way, um, but I would love to hear the three of you think together about bringing, like thinking about how justice work interfaces with um, science. That's it. <laughs> I'm not a scientist, so I, I'm, a, I'm a literature Sorry. person. I know. I sort of feel like I could be after that talk, um, which I really appreciated. I, I, you know, I think part of what I was saying uh, that when the Cultural Studies Association mounted this conference, under the rubric, under the, you know, sort of collective or, or, or under the idea of ecologies. And that's what they just titled the ecologies. There was a there was a sense in which what Leilani and I thought about was how do we bring environmental humanities and the humanities into this discussion, into this broader discussion about ecology? How do we rethink and reframe the actual terms for ecologies? So that's what we were thinking of. And I and it was very much, um, although, you know, those are materialist folks who, who think about capitalist structures uh, and who also are not, for the most part, scientists, although they're political scientists, right, many of them. It, it was not thinking how to bridge. And at the uh, Racial Ecologies Conference at UW, at University of Washington, that, the you know, preceded the publication of the book, we had many scientists actually, um, well, I shouldn't say many, but several scientists who came to think with us about what, what does the term ecology actually mean? Right? What, how, do, how can we, how is, has it been defined and how can it be redefined, right? How can we redefine it or reimagine it? Uh, so for some um, reason, the microphone's not working, okay. so we're going to have to just project. Sorry. Sorry, I, I'm just I'm I'm still processing his talk, so mm -hmm. that my part of me I'm like, oh my gosh, mm -hmm. what is the implication? You know, so I'm a little bit distracted, but I'm going to have to try to think about that later. Um, in the um, sustainability edited collection, uh, mm -hmm. we mm -hmm. talk a lot about interdisciplinarity um, and the and the politics of it. I've worked a lot with um, in interdisciplinary groups, um, but I think you know we, several of us have made, you know, talked about what the role of you know whether it's traditionally called ecological knowledge or um, native restorations, envir native environmental science projects look like. I mean, I think there are a lot of examples already. It's it's interesting to me also to think about. I think most of us are in humanities or humanistic social sciences here. And very rarely do we work outside in interdisciplinary groups. Um, mm -hmm. And it's really hard to mm -hmm. do that. And I remember once I was in a group of four people and one was an urban ecologist. Um, and she said, in my department, uh, interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary means a root person talking to a STEM person, like a STEM. In, of a plant, mm, like a root and a stem, where they were different fields within urban, within <laughs> ecology. Do you know what I mean? And so I think it's hard for it's hard for humanists and humanist social scientists to go talk, like learn, um, because there's so much you know co conflict and baggage, um, just epistemologically, you know, and because of the histories um, involved. But I think it, it's really necessary. Mm -hmm. And also that within STEM, there's a lot of different uh, general capacity to even want to have those conversations. Um, and so, you know, like, I don't I don't know you at all, but physicists are like the in general, like the when you find radical STEM people, they tend to be in physics. It's like <laughs> the, the physics department and the English department were the only departments that called for the resignation of our of our pepper spraying chancellor. Wow. You know what I mean? On the whole campus. Wow. You know, not the chemists, right. engineers. <laughs> they have different yeah. worldviews around yeah. this. Do you know what I mean? And so I think, you know, you ask a really important question, but it's also like there's so much variety within those. So um, I think, but I agree also, this goes back to Kim's point about, you know, thinking with people and, you know, thinking with others, you know, is, is I think, um, really important, but it's hard. 
Okay, and, and just let me quickly just add that I want to thank Curtis and Julie for being part of the collection. Mm -hmm. They were actually both people who we, and I'm th literally begged them to be part of this and so, so glad that they were about thinking together. How do we, interdisciplinarity, how does mm -hmm. it work? But I also want to say Diane Million, who wrote the indigenous chapter, mm -hmm. the first chapter, totally also a person we really wanted to be in the collection, but that was really difficult because she pushed against the whole notion of racial ecologies. And to the point, to your question, Amy, her thing was, first of all, she pushed against the racial, that she didn't like that at all. Then she said, indigenous knowledges have been doing this forever, as you pointed out. This is like, this is not new to us. This is not new to me. That So we had a lot of conversations with Diane about um, this question of sort of, what do we mean? Well, how are we, definitional questions, what are we doing in this collection? And totally disagreeing. And I'll tell you all a really funny story. She wrote her chapter and the editors at UW did all this editing. Like crazy, Curtis will remember this and Julie, I didn't edit yours that much, but, but the, Curtis were all of this editing, it was crazy. Like changing almost frick every sentence. They did that to mine too. And Diane, the most badass worshiper, she was like, oh, is that right? Right, because of the indigenous knowledges thing, right? They didn't like the style. They wanted it to be more academic, all of this, right? She did something I have never seen before. And that is, instead of doing the edits that they asked, she wrote a new chapter. And they, when she submitted it, they were like, this, this actually is a different chapter than the one you submit. It's not an edited chapter, it's totally different. And she said, yes, it is. So then we had to fight, Leilani and I had to fight to say, please, this is the, what she wants to say. And this is how she wants to say it, period, right? And, and that's just about sort of, again, knowledges, right? Epistemologies, as Julie said, and how that becomes a repressive, even within um, advocates, right? Even within allies, between allies. UW wanted, obviously, racial ecologies, but they wanted it to be a certain way. And she was having none of that. Um, I'll just uh, really briefly, uh address your question. Um, and I think it's very hard, like there's a, there are these kind of, in, in science and different fields, there are these cultures that make it very difficult to, um, to engage in this kind of, um, these kind of discussions. Um, so there, there is obviously a lot of pressure, especially within earth science, my department SIO, um, to, uh, to kind of talk about like the role of humans. Um, but basically what uh, uh, people in my department gravitate toward are the um, social scientists, the quantitative mm. social scientists. Yeah. So they'll talk to mm. the economists mm. because they're basically mathematicians. Um, mm. And they might talk to the political scientists if, they're, if they use math or they um, um, you know, uh, do fancy data analysis or something. Uh, but they won't talk to people who don't, aren't quantitative, mm -hmm. uh, because they don't feel, and they say this quite explicitly, that if, if something isn't quantitative, then it isn't real. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I think that's a huge barrier. Yeah. Um, um, and, I, and basically, I don't really have a, a, a suggestion about how to get over it, but, but I feel that there are, um, there are individuals who are willing to kind of cross that divide. And, and I feel that that's where those conversations have to, to start. Mm -hmm. Any other uh, questions? <laughs> Thank you. Um, so um, my question is thinking about, um, so in the first presentation, there was that um, wonderful um, quote and unpacking of um, James Baldwin's words about how whiteness is um, a suicide cult. And I just wanted to know if the entire panel could speak to that in relation to the last presentation and the idea of, um, you know, efficiency. So this, and I really want to stress the idea of efficiency. So like this idea that capitalism is um, producing efficiency, but then as we see in that really beautiful presentation, it's then disrupting stability by disrupting dissipation. And in that way, locking us all into this sort of like suicide call. Um, so I just wanted to know if the entire um, panel could speak to that. 
Mm-hmm. No. no. Well, let me just say, I'm actually literally writing a book about that very thing right now. Right. And so I'm not going to speak to it because I'm not going to, I know, I know. I, I don't feel comfortable talking about the new book project, but that's exactly what the new book project is about. Um, and I'm interviewing people and thinking very rigorously about the question that you just posed and whiteness, literally, as the death cult. Whiteness is the death cult, right? Whiteness is the death machine. And I'm going back to Melville and some of the other writers who have, in my opinion, historically thought about the whiteness as death, whiteness as suicide. Whiteness as, it's not just suicide, right? Whiteness as infanticide, whiteness as, right, um, uh, mass murder, whiteness as terror. Mm. I'm writing an essay on it, Stephen King's It, mm. and whiteness as terror. Mm. And so I, I'm thinking so much mm. about your question, and there's no way I can answer it because then I'll be talking about the book project, and I won't stop talking because I'm obsessed with it. I really am. Yeah. <laughs> I, it's, I've been thinking about what environmental justice movements have been fighting for and against for like 25 years um, since I was an undergrad, you know. Um, and so I wanted to start, I, I read you my conclusion in the introduction. I wanted to say, okay, well, things aren't always the same. You know, of course, we all know this, right? It's, it's, it's the changing same. Um, mm-hmm. But so I wanted to start off with this sense of like, you know, there there's also the understanding, the fact that you can go into a group. Oh, I'll tell you a story. I teach intro to American studies and I teach uh, I have a lecture on the KKK and birth of a nation. Mm-hmm. And for eight years under Obama, I always had students say, um, why do you teach about KKK and white supremacy? That's not relevant, mm-hmm. you know. Um, Nobody says that anymore, you know, <laughs> because of the moment we're in. You can say white supremacy without people freaking out, mm-hmm. you know, in, and, and that's, mm-hmm. I mean, we know why that is, right? And so um, in, in what, I, I don't know how I feel about this because part of me is like, you know, the, the, the um, complacency that we had under, you know, colorblindness and, you know, Obama, whatever, was also it, it dangerous too. Yeah. Um, but it's interesting because you could say Flint, you can say Standing Rock, you can say, you know, these things and people kind of know. And so that's one way in which, you know, that, that is, I think, a, a change, you know, now than from like in the 90s when environmental justice started being a movement that people organized around. Um, at the same time, so I, I have this introduction where I talk about Sierra Club and the anti-immigration xenophobia when Sierra Club almost elected, you know, white nationalist xenophobes as on their managing board. And this was a big thing in the late 90s. And they just, by the hair's breadth, that didn't happen, you know? Um, And then Sierra Club passed this like solidarity statement with Black Lives Matter. So to me, I was like, okay, well, we have to also account, things are not the same, right? So that's a good thing. Mm. In mainstream environmentalism, you don't see open xenophobia, you know, (laughs) And, and racism. And that wasn't true in the 90s. So yes, that's great. Things have changed in some sense, and that's a good thing. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, the the um, the threads of xenophobia, eugenicism, um, the and you could see them um, in the way that climate change fears are being mobilized by people in the alt right, like all this stuff around accelerationism, white genocide. You know, that's where it is bubbling up again, right? And so. Um, I think that that's part of the whiteness and the obsession with whiteness and the obsession with the authoritarians like losing um, their status. And, you know, I, I quote in the book, um, this Blanks and Hughes, you know, poem, The Kids Who Die. Mm. Um, and mm. it, and it, when Trayvon Martin was murdered, you know, that poem got a lot of recirculation. But, it, you know, the opening of it, it called, talks about the kids who die. Um, I'm summing it up. I don't have the words. You should look it up if you haven't read it. But he says, you know, the old will live on for a while, um, eating blood and gold, you know. Um, and so, you know, I talk about like, that's the moment we're in, you know, mm-hmm. the kids dying and the mm-hmm. old believing you can eat blood, gold and oil, you know. And at yet 
the optimism, this is where I still have to have something, yeah. Yeah. is that a lot of people are not okay with that. Yeah. You know, you can't live and on the bodies of young, the future generations. You can't live on profit. You can't eat blood, gold, and oil. And so that's where, you know, that's, I'm, I'm trying to sort through all this myself too, you know, and what is this attachment um, yes. to it? Yes. And part of it is the, the fear, you know, the fear of the loss of status, the fear of the, the known, you know, um, but I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know. And I will give you one little tidbit from, from the book. And I don't know how controversial this is, but it's super controversial in my classes where I teach kindred. What I'm trying to do in the new work and new project is argue as much for Rufus as I do for Dana. And I'll leave it at that, right? How can I argue as much for what Rufus represents? And I think Octavia Butler wants us to do exactly that because the death machine won't stop if we don't argue enough as much, right? As much for Rufus as we do for Dana. Meaning like, what, what, where is he positioned? How is he positioned? What can we say about what the struggle is? Mm -hmm. And I do believe that Octavia Butler presents us with Rufus struggling. He's struggling when we meet him. He's drowning. Mm -hmm. He's literally, literally drowning in whiteness. Mm -hmm. um, just briefly, um, I basically, as a, as a person who kind of looks at the science and the dynamics of these systems of whiteness, of capitalism, of colonialism. Um, and I don't want to sound negative, but I feel that they are, they are systems that over hundreds of years have been tuned mm -hmm. to be very, very powerful and very, very resistant to challenge. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I feel that when we're thinking about uh, trying to overcome them, either in our little spaces or on the big scale, we have to really acknowledge that incredible power that, um, that these systems, which have, I mean, it's just kind of like biological evolution. They, they've developed these, these very, very powerful ways of, of um, putting down challenges. Um, and so, so to me, that's like always the, um, the difficulty in like in being hopeful is mm. is seeing how to get around um, those challenges, and I believe that that um, you know that we have the power to do that, but it's it's going to take a long time, a lot of effort, and uh, sustained effort. But would you say it's like a virus that mute that 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 when you say how powerful it has become, I'm thinking when you're talking it like a virus yeah, yeah. I think, that re I think develops a resistance. A, I think that's a good uh, a good metaphor. Um, and um, uh, yes, basically it um, it's mutating, it's changing mm -hmm. as as we challenge it. Every time we challenge it, it's it's learning. Yes. Um, yes. And and so so that challenge once we've done that challenge and not knocked it out basically that challenge is no longer in our in our toolkit mm -hmm. uh, because it's learned how to deal with that. Mm. Mm. Do, do we have time for one more? You can take one more. To, uh, uh, one more question. Uh, uh, yes, sir, right here. Um, so my question is, uh, just to give a bit of context, I'm working in the design lab on campus and right now we're putting together a civic design competition for um, students running from like elementary school, high school kids, high school kids, and even like folks my age, like undergraduate, up to like young professionals. And so we're thinking about how to make San, San Diego in particular a more sustainable city. And so we have a couple of different topic spaces. And one of them is climate, one of them is housing, transportation. And so the thing I've been struggling with is so I looked at what they did for 2017, and I kind of had a lot of issues with it because there wasn't a whole lot of rethinking about how they're framing the issues. And so they sort of just like jump into framing problems instead of thinking more so about uh, what's led to how they, mm. how these problems are being framed. Mm. And so I've been trying to do a lot more reading just into the thinking behind these ideas and challenges that we're facing. And so my question to you guys is how do you take, how would you take and abstract like the core, like 
I don't know, the nucleus of how you're rethinking climate or environmentalism, and then repackage it in a way that folks who are younger can begin to engage with it. Mm -hmm. Because there's a lot of good work being done in terms of reframing at this higher level, but it can't just stay here. It needs to be disseminated into like the younger generation. Mm -hmm. And so how would you um, kind of, would be your ticket that you would give to someone younger to begin unpacking and playing with that in a way that is kind of conducive to where they're at? Well, I, I always like to read what activists produce, like movement manifestos um, are powerful statements of values, but they also have pragmatic um, things that are, I'm not a policy person, but that, that are translatable to policy. So um, Uprose, the group in New York that I work with on their climate justice front, they're, they're, they follow the Hamez principles of organizing. Um, and the building the our power uh, and just transition um, principles, um, and so they have there there are places that try to like both visualize but then on like an operationalizable scale like what does it mean to move not you know from an extractive to a regenerative you know economy and what would that actually look like and so I think if you have the values that guide then you can start like thinking how does that plug in with like you know, um, community-based solar instead of individual, you know, owner solar, or um, how do you do uh, just, uh, you know, like Green New Deal was borrowed a lot actually from um, a lot of the thinking that climate justice and just transition activists have been, you know, advocating for a while. Um, like, what does it mean to, you know, have their local community be the place where a lot of the wind turbines are going to be built, you know, so looking at just transition as an economic development strategy for low income and communities of color. And so I think, you know, this for a lot of people know about the principles of environmental justice for good reason. But, you know, there are the indigenous principles for just transition were just written like a year ago, you know. And so for me, I mean, this is a little bit more like my I, you know, scholar, I'm a scholar activist, um, but the activists do a lot of the, the like trying to think about what it looks like. Um, and so, but they're always guided by like fundamental principles, you know, and there's organizations that are trying to think about this. So the, the you know, the shorthand is like the Just Transition Alliance, the Building Equity and Alignment, you know, Our Power Campaign. Um, they have lots of models. And then I just met a woman who's doing a lot of um, climate justice curriculum building, mm -hmm. you know, on the K-12 Mm -hmm. level mm -hmm. um, and then also focusing on teacher training curriculum like to align with like California standards so there are people who are trying to take you know how do, the translational like big picture thing and then like how do you do it in mm -hmm. a school mm -hmm. how do you do it in a in a um, project level like how do you do it in a community you know and it's just you know I think if you know where the hubs are then you can kind of see and learn but then also like build it I mean there isn't you know, some of it is just improvisational too, and thinking and thinking together is is, is part of it. Um, we heard some awesome fiction this morning, mm -hmm. really outstanding. And I say, I, I story, yes. stories are so important, and the imaginative is so mm -hmm. important, and speculative literature is so important. <coughs> Getting students to read, maybe that mm -hmm. sounds old fashioned, but for me, that is actually a very, um, uh, we have a 14 year old who is um, a strict vegetarian and who's doing her eighth grade project on um, what she titled herself, the normalization of the cruelty of animals. And she is reading a vegan, vegan vampire book right now, I can't remember the name of it, novel. Wow. And so, and she's an eighth grader, right? She's wow. 14 years old. And so I, I feel like students are there, like at the, through the K, they're there, but they just need what you, I hear you saying the resources, mm -hmm. they need the support, the encouragement, but also the resources. So I would say Adrian, I think Adrian Marie Brown and Octavia Butler, and particularly Octavia but, um, Octavia's Brood, are pretty accessible. Mm -hmm. I don't know if other people agree with me, but I think they're pretty accessible for K through 12 um, uh, group of, uh, of students. Um, and so I would highly encourage that. 
because they have their own stories, but if they're exposed to other stories, mm-hmm. the magic, yeah, right, magic, right, is so important to think imaginatively, right, and to think about um, and to invite their own their stories as well, right. Um, just uh, one slightly different uh, perspective. I really like uh, your ideas. Um, uh, Basically, the one thing that I really find cool about youth is uh, they're naturally rebellious and questioning. Yeah. Um, and I feel that basically um, to be able to do anything useful with respect to climate, uh, we have to basically be constantly questioning the BS mm-hmm. that's coming down the pike. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, um, uh, so I feel that kind of helping students young people to be, I mean, in the schools, they're basically, they're trying to stamp out all that yep, question right, right. and rebellion, mm-hmm. um, but basically giving them a place where they can uh, <coughs> think critically, to question, to rebel, basically, against um, these things that they're hearing, these discourses mm-hmm. that are being, they're being exposed to, and, um, you know, help guide them through that question. Mm-hmm. Great. We're more than out of time, but thank you very much for the great round of